spirit of life, we seek comfort in the quiet and the stillness, away from the blazing yule and the blinking lights. In this space, may we find ourselves once again. May we give ourselves permission to be ourselves, perfect in our imperfections, carrying all that we carry, vulnerable, real, and true. May we experience here for a time our true feelings, rather than some prepackaged Dickensian holiday happiness, knowing that here we are safe, here we are nurtured, here we are loved. May this be a time of renewal for our tired, aching souls, so that we may be fortified for the days ahead. Yesterday was World AIDS Day, an opportunity for people worldwide to unite in the fight against HIV AIDS, to show their support for people living with HIV and AIDS, and to commemorate people who have died. The first World AIDS Day was held in 1988, and it was the first ever Global Health Day. Today, we set aside time during our service to remember those who have died of AIDS. AIDS is a pandemic that hit Provincetown especially hard. And so today we remember those who lived and died here, who changed this community forever. AIDS is also a pandemic that continues all across the world. A few days ago, I got a message from my friend Kudzai from Zimbabwe. She said, I received a message on my cell phone from Net1, a Zimbabwe cell phone provider. It was a reminder that tomorrow is World AIDS Day. My eyes welled up, she said. Tears fell onto my cheeks as I remembered all those who I know who succumbed to AIDS, my uncles, aunts, cousins, my friends and acquaintances, and all those whom I did not know. I always wonder, she said, how many of them would have made it? Who would have pulled through if ARVs and other medication had been readily available? What would life be like if they were still here? Kudzai said, I continue to pray for all who are living with AIDS and for all who are in denial to seek counseling and help. Let's work together to eradicate the stigma associated with HIV and AIDS. Today we remember that there are 40 million people living with HIV AIDS worldwide. And we remember that this disease is something that we need to talk about that it cannot be hushed or ignored or shamed away. And we remember. In front of me, you see two amazing pieces of artwork. And in your bulletin, you can find a red piece of paper telling you more about them. They were created by Kurt Reynolds, who lit our chalice this morning, who is a new member of the Provincetown community and soon to be a member here at the UU Meeting House. Kurt is a longtime AIDS activist, artist, and long-term survivor of AIDS. His constructions, unfinished work, and HIV AIDS obituary chair are memorial pieces lent to us this morning for our worship in observance of World AIDS Day. In a moment, I'll invite you to come forward and see them more closely. We also have handed out red strips of paper this morning, evoking the red ribbons worn as a symbol of AIDS awareness all over the world. 
We invite you to write the name or names of your friends and loved ones who have died of AIDS and bring them forward to our altar table in an act of remembrance. During this remembrance ritual, John and James will offer a song. This song was written by my dear friend uh, Michael Callan, who sang many times in this sanctuary with the flirtations. He's a wonderful person, a wonderful musician, and a, an AIDS warrior. He testified before Congress. He wrote books. He founded the People with AIDS Coalition. And he was a big old queen. Just a wonderful, wonderful person. And he sang it every, every year at the AIDS Walk in New York City. Spirit of life, spirit of love and memory, we lift up the names of our friends who have died. Help us to remember them, to keep them present. 
Help us to live out their intentions in this world, their projects begun and not finished, their love not fully recognized, their artwork half created. We are here to keep alive their dreams. Help us to remember not just their dying, but their living, their laughter and friendship and spirit in this sacred time and every day we remember them. Amen. Our reading this morning is by Reverend Richard Gilbert entitled The Empty Chair. There is something about an empty chair that reminds us of our ultimate loneliness, evoking memories of those we have loved and lost. No longer will they occupy that chair, however much their image is etched in our memory. Chairs know the comings and goings of people, the assault of young bodies and the gentler weight of old ones. They know the passing of the years. They absorb all in well-worn wood. There is something in us that doesn't like an empty chair, that wants it occupied by the ones we love and loved. Its presence haunts us with memories that fade but do not die. We reach out across empty space, encircling nothing but a memory. Our fingers caress the well-known cracks and grooves, as familiar to us as the body that filled them. Our eyes create the image of a former time when loved ones brought a chair to life and endeared it to us. Now, there is little to do but sit, supported by the strength of years, occupying beloved space for a time, rejoicing in times gone by never to return. People like chairs are full of memories, memories that sustain our coming in and our going out from this day forward. My colleague Jane Jepka writes, ministers' columns at this time of the year say one of two things. The holiday season is a happy time, or the holidays are depressing. I'm glad I didn't read these words before writing my December piece for our own Meeting House News because the pressure to come down in one camp or the other would have been too much for me. I didn't know I had to choose, and so I wrote about both. Jane goes on, the happy time school of thought makes a case for generosity, good cheer, and a deepening spirituality, whereas the depression advocates cite studies that prove that winter holidays are difficult. At the moment, the Happy Holidays group has a slight edge, the freshest crop of PhDs having studied our December moods and found them to be merry after all. <laughs> I beg to differ, she says. With no empirical work at all to back me up, I'd like to make a case, she says for people being regular people, even when December rolls around. I think Jane makes a good case, empirical evidence or no. People are regular people. Death and illness and grief do not stop because it is December. On holidays, we try to celebrate, but we are also mourning people who are gone from us and relationships that have ended and dreams that have not come true. 
And so sometimes we have a blue Christmas. When Megan Lloyd Joyner was 10 years old, her family got a call on Christmas Eve. Her grandfather had just suffered a massive heart attack. Megan's father took the first flight out to meet him at the hospital. Megan writes, I was 10, my brother was five. That night we wrote our letters to Santa, but we were distracted. How could we ask for toys? As was our tradition, we got into our new pajamas and all read, "'Twas the night before Christmas." But Dad wasn't there, and our hearts were in a hospital room in South Carolina. Megan remembers praying, "'Please don't let him die on Christmas.'" And she isn't sure whether the prayer was for her grandfather or for herself. The next morning at Megan's house, Santa had come. The milk and cookies were gone, and there was a trail of dog food from the bowl they had left for the reindeer out to the balcony of their apartment. It was, as it always was, magical. There were beautiful presents under the tree. For Megan, a little keyboard that had what seemed like hundreds of sounds and beats and flashing lights. Her dad called around noontime. Her grandfather had died. Expressing the conflicted feelings that perhaps only a 10-year-old can be completely honest about, Megan remembers being confused and sad and angry. Angry because it felt like this had ruined Christmas for everyone and forever. But then she felt selfish and was confused because though she was sad, she wanted to be happy. And part of her was happy. Like her grandfather, Megan loved Christmas. She worried that this meant she didn't love him enough, but then decided with a wisdom far beyond her years that it was just hard to hold both, the pain of loss and the joy of Christmas. That afternoon, she played slow, dirge-like songs on her new keyboard. And we are not unlike 10-year-old Megan. We are a bundle of conflicting emotions at this time of year as we head into the holidays, excited and happy, sad and lonely, bitter and angry, guilty and confused and happy again expectant, hopeful. It's hard to hold all of this in one heart. It's especially hard to hold all of this in one heart when we are also holding ourselves up against the image of the easy, uncomplicated holiday season that we see on TV and in the movies that one-dimensional holiday spirit that is full of joy and merriment and has no room for sadness or loss or loneliness. Society doesn't know what to do with the complexity of experience. Holiday grief can't be sold or marketed. You can't put a big red bow on it. But people are regular people, even in December. I'm sure you all know the wonderful song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. I wonder if any of you know the history of it, though. In 1943, 
Hugh Martin and Ralph Blaine were a successful songwriting team hired to write the songs for the movie musical Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland. Just as an aside, it was on the set of this movie that Judy Garland would meet her future husband, director Vincent Minnelli. Martin and Blaine were asked to write a song for the now famous scene in which Garland and her little sister, a seven-year-old Margaret O'Brien, are despondent over the prospect of moving away from their cherished home in St. Louis just before Christmas. Their father is moving them to New York City. The girls are heartbroken. Hugh Martin was the one who came up with the tune and the original words for this scene, the song that would become Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. But Martin's first draft was so sorrowful that Judy Garland refused to sing it. It had lines like, Have yourself a merry little Christmas. It may be your last. <laughs> And faithful friends who were dear to us will be near to us no more. The lines made sense, though, not only for the movie, but also for the times. This song was written during World War II. For so many soldiers and their families, faithful friends who were dear to them, would be near to them no more. But you couldn't put a red bow on it. You said the scene was supposed to be sad, said Martin. Not that sad, said the director. At first, Martin was reluctant to change the words, but that was mostly out of pride, he admits. In the end, he rewrote the song with the more familiar verses. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. Next year, all our troubles will be out of sight. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. Next year, all our troubles will be miles away. Once again, as in olden days, happy golden days of yore, faithful friends who were dear to us will be near to us once more. But he still ended it with the song's most powerful lines. Someday soon, we all will be together if the fates allow. Until then, we'll have to muddle through somehow. So have yourself a merry little Christmas now. In Judy Garland's melancholy voice, the song is still haunting in that scene. But the song never caught on in popular culture. Instead, the starring song of the movie became the trolley song. With its simple, uncomplicated lyrics, you might remember it. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. <laughs> so much easier on the heart than worrying if the fates would allow us to be together again. So much easier on the mind than muddling through somehow. It wasn't until 1957 when Frank Sinatra was compiling his new Christmas album that the words to the song changed once again. Sinatra called Martin with a request Listen, he said, the name of my album is A Jolly Christmas. <laughs> he didn't like the muddle through line. 
Do you think you could jolly up that line for me? He asked. And so the last lines of the song became, Through the years we all will be together, If the fates allow, Hang a shining star upon the highest bough, And have yourself a merry little Christmas now. This is better without a cold. <laughs> It's been a little confusing, says Martin, because half the people sing one line and half sing the other. But that makes sense to me. Some of us are decorating the Christmas tree and some of us are taking it day by day, getting through. I think Linda Ronstadt came up with a good solution in her recording though. She solves the problem by singing both verses. And so the song reflects more accurately the complexity of the season. We muddle through. And we find that little beacon of hope and bravery, memory and prayer to hang the shining star upon the highest bough. At our holiday tables this year, we will have both happiness and loneliness, merriment and grief, loved ones and empty chairs. All are part of this Christmas season. Megan, who lost her grandfather on Christmas when she was 10, grew up to write these words. We have loved and we have lost. We are afraid, uncertain, and discouraged. We hurt. And still, with tears on our cheeks, we sing our prayers for peace. We proclaim hope in our broken world. We pray that God may be with us in times of trial. And we give thanks for unexpected moments of comfort. We sing for our beloveds, the love of whom brings us great joy. Be they with us now in body or in spirit only. We sing in celebration of all the babies that keep being born, each of them holy, each of them perfect. We sing for ourselves and for each other as we gently cradle our broken hearts. We hold a light out in the darkness, love's pure light in anticipation of a most holy night. Amen. <laughs>